It was Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz who said, there's no place like there's no place like home, and this is true. It's especially true if you've been gone from home a while. When I say home today, I'm talking about not necessarily the house we grew up in, though that will be true for so many of us. I'm talking about whatever that positive thing is in your heart, your history, your life even today that represents home for you. There's no place like home. It's why we're doing the home initiative. It's why we started this church almost nine years ago to create home for people who live in the city and people who will come to this city. But there's no place like home, especially when you've been gone from home a while. Would you agree? Even some of you, who's traveling for the holidays? It's lying. You're lying. We don't have this many people who stay in San Francisco. If you're, some of you are like, I'm making my mind up. Some of you, you make $300,000, but you're only going home if your parents pay for your flight. Come on! Help your parents out. There's something in scripture about you taking care of them. They, they've spent enough time taking care of you because you're 43 and still asking if they will bring you home. It was the summer of 2000. I spent that summer in Philadelphia. I worked at a camp for two solid months at Eastern University. And every single week, a couple hundred teenagers would come from church groups, and I was the camp pastor. So it meant six nights a week for the entire eight weeks, I was speaking to teenagers. Um, You think you're difficult to speak to. No, no, they're actually better than some of you. Um, But I would speak every single night, every single night all summer, and by the end, you could imagine I was exhausted, looking forward to going home, quite a drive home from Philadelphia to where my parents' home was in Louisiana. Finally, I was just about there. I don't know about you, but when you go home, whatever home is for you, do you have those markers that let you know you're just about there? For me, it was turning into the subdivision. It was crossing the railroad tracks. It was taking the first left. I pulled into the sixth house on the left, into the driveway at 311 Shady Lane. So if you want to know why I'm so weird, I grew up my whole childhood on Shady Lane. I pull into 311 Shady Lane. I'm anticipating seeing my parents. I had let them know when I was coming home. At least I think I let them know when I was coming home. But we didn't have a cell phone back then. It was the year 2000, at least for us. Some of you were rocking the bag phone or the Zach Morris phone, but we didn't have that at the time. And so um, I go home, and I am kind of that romantic fairy tale guy. Like everything in life is going to be better than it actually turns out to be. Anybody else? It's like in my mind, there's fireworks going off. My parents are like, we've missed you. We haven't eaten all summer because you've been gone. I rush into the door, ready for that embrace, and there's no one home. But it gets worse. I go into the kitchen, and I can tell that they already had dinner. I thought for sure. I was a picky eater back then. I thought for sure one of the three or four meals I actually liked would be available for me when I walked in the door. But I recognized not only was it not a meal I liked, it was a meal that I knew that my mom knew that I did not like. I've expanded my horizons with my taste buds, but back then I had not. And I got to the kitchen and saw that there was still some left, but it was hamburger helper. Anybody? Some of you remember that fondly. It wasn't on my top anything list except for things I did not like. And so now I have, remember, it's been like a 20-hour drive home. So like, I'm coming home. It's going to be amazing. I walk in. It's not amazing. No one's there. The dog's not even there as far as I remember And then I go into the kitchen and realize that they weren't expecting me, they weren't prepared for me, they had not anticipated me showing up. Now, to my parents' credit, two things. Number one, I could not let them know when I was coming home, they could not find my iPhone because I did not have an iPhone. Um, And secondly, when I did finally see my parents, they were really glad to see me, okay? My dad's watching online, that's the only reason I say that. And, uh, (laughs) and, (laughs) I'll get a call today, which would be awesome. Um... But I tell you that story because all of us can picture something like that in our minds where we were hopeful that someone would receive us and when we got there, it just wasn't that at all. I want us to get our hearts and minds around. I tell you that story to get our hearts and minds around what are people going to find when they come home to God and could Epic Church community be used in a mighty way over the coming decades when people return home? I started praying a prayer this week that I haven't prayed ever before, and it's really for, I just found myself thinking about the home initiative and what we're trying to create, and I just began praying for Epic Church 50 years from now. Like, Ben, that's crazy. We don't even have our 10th birthday yet. I know. I'm just telling you. I don't want to be a part of something that rises with us and leaves with us. I want to give myself to something that will outlast myself, and I hope that you want to embrace that as well, church. That's what I want us to do. So as we continue the home series today, I want us to get our hearts set on the people who aren't here yet but will be one day in a talk I'm calling When They Come Home. When They Come Home. 
when they come home, because they're going to show up here. People who don't live in San Francisco today will, some of them live here 12 months from now, and others three and a half years from now, and some 11 years from now, but they're going to come here. And it's not up just to us. I'm thankful for the brothers and sisters we have in the city who are leading strong churches all over San Francisco, but when they show up, will we have created anything for them to show up to? That's what this is about. This is what we're doing. It's our heart. It's not so that I can find home or you can. We've kind of found it. We've got to exist for something beyond ourselves. Would you agree? That's what we want to do because they're going to show up. I mean, there are children who haven't been born yet who will be born in this city or move to the city at a very young age. Don't we want to do everything we can so that they can have a foundation for their life and faith moving forward, knowing the reality and sinking into the fact that God loves them and he has a plan for them? I would love for every three and four-year-old to know that. Some of us didn't learn that till we were 30 or 40. Can we agree? Why not, why not make sure that we have something positioned for them? Right now, there are currently people living in our city far from God who would not think twice about walking in the doors of a church. Do you work with anybody like that? I want you to imagine, they have as much chance of coming to faith in Jesus as you do and I do. But then that's so far-fetched. I know that's the whole point of Christianity. That a God would somehow prick our hearts in a way and open us up to the reality that he loves us and that he would stop at nothing to do whatever it takes to bring us back home. That's what we're about. There are people in our city right now who are trying to find ultimate satisfaction in pleasure and wealth accumulation and success. And here's what I know because you and I have all been there. They're going to turn up empty at some point in time and they will seek it somewhere else. And when they do, will we have another option for them? There are people in our city right now that are filled with loneliness and isolation, but at some point in time, they're going to think there's got to be something more than this, and they will begin to seek community, maybe in a variety of ways, but should they darken the doors of our church, will we have created some place for them to belong where they will eventually believe? I want to give my life to this. I make no bones about it. I say it unapologetically. I want to invite you to do the same, and I'm thrilled for those of you who've already just let me know, Ben, we're, we're, we're in it. Let's go. Let's go for it. Here, here's the question I want to ask. Will we do whatever it takes in this season for the sake of that future moment when they come home? Will we do whatever it takes in this season for the sake of that future moment when they come home? I want to paint a picture of our future. Today's going to be a little bit different teaching, so I want to go ahead and just load you uh, with that reality. We're going to have a little bit of a different teaching. I want to think a lot about the narrative of Scripture today, and I want to think a lot about the idea of our imagination. And I want those two things to compel us to consider what God might do in the future. For our text today, I want to go to the uh, undoubtedly the most popular parable in all of Scripture in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Um, it's a long passage, so you can stay seated today. Uh, I want you to really enter into this narrative, Luke 15, 11 through chapter, uh, chapter 11, uh, 15, 11 through verse 32. I want you to see yourself in this story because you're in the story. There are three characters primarily in the story outside of the servants. There's a father, there's an older son, there's a younger son. Two things I want to tell you. Number one is that you are identified by one of those characters currently with your present reality. But if you're not the character in the story you want to be, would you be open to God bringing you into the heartbeat of a different character in that story? Here we go. This is the whole idea. Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables. We're going to look at the third one. He's surrounded by, if you look at verse 1, he's surrounded by tax collectors and sinners on the one hand and Pharisees on the other hand, so the religious people and the irreligious people. The first parable he tells is about a lost bat. That was a bad bat, but you know. And the second parable he tells is about a lost coin, and now he's talking about a lost son, or I would say two lost sons. Luke 15, verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, here's the rehearsal, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father, hear this, went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You may be seated. (laughs) Each one of us has left home metaphorically. Every single one of us in this room, we have taken the blessings of God in our lives, have we not? And we've wanted nothing to do with God. Anybody besides the pastor? And we found ourselves in that distant land. Anybody remember what it's like to be in that distant country? Just me? To remember what it was like to think that we knew better? To think that we would find it in what the world offered us? To think that we would find it in him or we would find it in her? We would find it in our accomplishment? You see, we became convinced that we would find what we most wanted very far from home, metaphorically speaking. And we went for it, and we tried it. And some of us in this room, we got everything we had set our heart on, and in the end, we were like, is this it? Others of us, we just kept searching. We never quite got the thing or things that we were after, and yet we also came to realize, I'm just empty. So we thought, I just want to go home. I want to go home, but I don't know what my heavenly father will respond with when I show up. And just like this younger son, we rehearse messages because we don't always have an accurate view of God, do we? I think the two things that have destroyed most of our lives most often are that we don't have an accurate picture of God and we don't have an accurate picture of ourselves. But we We came home anyway. We didn't have any other choice in our minds. And when we got there, rather than experiencing condemnation, we received a warm embrace. Rather than the judgment of God being primary, the mercy of God became primary. Rather than being punished for what we had done out in that distant country, we were welcomed and given the grace of God. And we found a love unlike we could find out there when we came home. And all we could think to ourselves, two things, I can't believe he loves me like this, and I can't believe I ever left home or didn't come home sooner. And here's what I know in a room like this, those of you watching online, there are people who today are living in that distant land. Some of you have been there for a decade. Some of you, it was just a last night thing, and it's that fresh. And you wondered, would there be any hope? Would there be any grace? Would there be any love? Would there be any compassion if you showed up in a community that represents the God of heaven? And I want you to hear from this story. Jesus is saying, absolutely, I am here, and I'm here for you. But here's the question I have for us. When we think about other people who move to the city or the Bay Area and they come home, here's the question. When they come home, what will we have created for them to come home to? This question matters. When they come home, what will we have created for them to come home to? One of the things you probably don't think about But when you link your experience of what God has done as you've entered this epic church community, you need to be able to link that experience with some group, a smaller group than we have today, preparing the way and anticipating you showing up. We didn't know how beautiful your face was. We didn't know your industry. We didn't know what neighborhood you would choose when you moved here. We didn't even know the day that you would come in. But everything from day one for epic church has been about you showing up one day. And church, we can't lose that. So what will they find when they show up? I think it comes down to this question. Will our heart be like the heart of the older brother or will our heart be like the heart of the father? Look at the disposition of the older brother. He had a home already and he was good with that. He didn't want his brother to come back. Everybody can read that into the text, yes? 
He didn't want him to show up at all. And he doesn't say this in the text, but you can imagine he didn't want his father to adopt anyone else either. He had home, he was good, and if someone else became a son or daughter to the father or a son again, he would have to share his inheritance with them. And don't miss the story. When Jesus says that he gave his inheritance to the younger brother, he said that his father went ahead and divided it for both of them. And in that context, in that historical moment of culture, the younger son would have gotten one-third of his father's estate, and the older son would have gotten two-thirds. And from everything we read into the text, from the parable of Jesus, he's already been given that. And he's good. And he doesn't care at all if that former brother of his ever shows back up at home. But let me tell you about the heart of the Father as I challenge you and I to embrace that heart. Here's the heart of the Father. Here's his entire posture. He knows that home won't be home as long as that son is out there. Like, Ben, how do you know? It's in the text, for starters, but there are three parables Jesus tells to drive home the point. Remember who's present, Pharisees and sinners. He knows that Pharisees are going to count one strike against the sinners, and they're going to be out of the kingdom of God. And he's trying to say, quit being like the older brother. My heart is for those younger brothers. That's my heart. And until the younger brother shows up, the father just knows he won't have the sense of home that he knows is supposed to be home. Ben, how do you know? Because Jesus tells a parable at the beginning of this chapter, and he says a shepherd has 100 sheep. If just one of them wanders off, he will leave the 99 to go find the one. I think that's crazy. You know how we would respond if we had 100 sheep and one of them left? I still got an A. A high A. I don't know if there's any extra credit, but I've got an A. I'm good. We've reached so many people. There's a tension you and I need to hold. I want to invite you into what our leaders and our pastors think about this tension here at Epic. There's two things, and and we can hold them together. The first one is we're amazed at what God has done. You need to know we have outkicked our coverage in a major way. We never would have imagined before our ninth birthday that we would have seen God do what he's done. So that's one hand. Celebrate that. Do not be the kind, I'm not coming until 800,000. No, no, no. Celebrate that. And here's the other side that we, hold, that we hold in tension. There's still so many more people to reach. We do both. We love that this room is almost filled this morning. That's awesome. We're going to create a bigger room for more people because they're not all here yet. And we're going to link arms with our brothers and sisters who are leading amazing churches in the city as well and pray that God would invite more. And we're going to give to those church plants and we're going to reach here. We're not going to be either or, oh, it's all about Epic. No, no, no. We want God to do amazing things through Epic and then we're going to lock arms with everyone else to see what God might do throughout our entire city. And we just won't rest. And sometimes I think, and maybe I even get persuaded by other people not to go so forward in public with what Shauna and I are locked into from God's vision for us, But as best we know, we are so in this that you're stuck with us. And here's why we're in this. Every time she and I talk, we just say we can't imagine doing anything else besides what God's, the the vision's too high. And here's, here's what I said to somebody this week. If I fall flat on my face, I'm going to fall flat on my face going for it with a heart for people. Man, that's risky. We're going, we're trying to raise this and it might not even be enough. Okay, I'll gladly fall flat on my face pursuing the vision and God's heart for this city. And when I do, I'm going to ask you for a job. Because <laughs> I'll need one. This is our heart. It's our heart. The generosity of the father in the story stunned the older brother, and he stunned the younger brother. Would you agree? And the generosity of our Heavenly Father should stun us. Even if you're angry about his generosity, some of us get angry, don't we? God, I've done all of this thing, and then this person who's such a terrible sinner, they come to church one day, and it's like it's all been forgiven. Like, yep, that's the gospel message of Christianity. But not just for the younger brother, for the older brother too. Did you hear what the father said to the older brother? Everything I have is yours. Sometimes we feel like if God blesses someone else, we miss out. Anybody ever felt that way? No, you sinners, you're lying right now. Anybody besides me? I work so hard, I've been pure, I've done the right thing, and God, really? And then I remember, then all that you have is grace. And the Lord is your shepherd, you don't lack anything. We're not missing out just because they're getting in on it. Now imagine if the older brother had a heart like his father. Imagine when he hears that the the, the music and the celebration's coming, and he, he, he wonders, like, did it happen? Did the thing happen that we've been hoping for, we've been preparing for, we've been praying for, that my father's been begging for? Did it happen? And he says to the servant, like he did in the text, "Um, 
what is all this noise? And the, the servant said, your brother come, has come home. Imagine if his heart was different. He runs like his father ran. And he embraces him. He gets to the party. He's just looking for him. And finally, their eyes meet. And he runs to him. And he embraces him. And emotions begin to overflow because all he wanted was to see him come home. What if that could become our heart? We can't just be thankful that we found a home. But let me ask you this. If this is your home, aren't you thankful that you found a home here at Epic? Me too, but I can't rest with that. I want you to hear from a couple in our church community about how they have found a home here at Epic. But they're not going to rest with that reality. They're going to push forward and invest so that other people can find that home as well. Watch this. We launched Epic Church at the W Hotel in 2011. And though I had high hopes, I'm not sure I ever could have imagined all that would take place between that day and today. We've seen over 200 baptisms in our church. There are over 100 kids and students who show up at Epic each Sunday. 40 small groups where people just like you are experiencing community and growing in your faith. We've given over $1.5 million to our local and global partners. We have this clarifying vision to see an increasing number of people here in San Francisco orient their entire lives around Jesus. And now with this home initiative, we are going to be able to see this vision become an even greater reality. My name is Michelle Stevens. And I'm Trey Stevens. We've been going to Epic since the fall of 2014. And we have two small children, Thaddeus and Solomon. Our previous church where we moved from in Washington, D.C. was a bit of a mega church, tens of thousands of people every Sunday. And we loved it, but we were present at the church and not a part of the church. And that was something that I think we were both really interested in getting more involved in as we have moved out to the West Coast. Church had never been a place that we had found a strong community of, of friends. Moving to San Francisco, I don't think we necessarily had an expectation that that was what was going to happen. But what we found is that not only did we find a community of believers that we could share life with, we actually found our family thousands of miles away from home. Because of community, I feel like we have this constant connection. And that means that we are connected through the hard times and the good times. And when I have those people that can walk with me through all of it, it makes the good even sweeter and the hard um, a little easier to get through. We felt, I think, eventually that we wanted to give back and uh, a way in which we thought, uh, according to our giftings, was a way to do so was by starting a small group around matters of faith and work. Michelle and I moved out here thinking that we were transients, that within five years we were going to move back to the East Coast and resume our life kind of where we left it off. Um, and doing that prohibited us in some way from really investing in the neighborhood, the city, the community that was right in front of us. Um, and we were locked into this make, a, make the world a better place kind of view. And I think going through the faith and work curriculum um, really helped us understand the importance of seeing what is immediately in front of you and doing your part, playing your part, that God has called us into that transformational activity um, in our own community groups. In order to make a long-term investment in a place, you have to actually say that you are long-term. Being short-term, being transient, uh, it never really allows you to mentally lock into the idea that you're going to have to make long-term decisions about the commitments that you've made. Yeah, something clicked for us when we became homeowners, that we felt like now every move that we make is an investment in something greater, in something long-term. So as we are committing to our home, um, we also get to commit long-term to our church. I think immediately I think about beauty and I think about how the city can be so loud and dirty and annoying um, and constantly moving and changing and wow how exciting could it be would it be if we had this like beautiful permanent space having the ability to grow into more space uh, gives people a sense of 
belonging, that they're not just coming in and you know standing in the back of a filled capacity room. They're coming in and uh, feel encouraged to help contribute to filling out that space and then filling out the next space and then filling out the next space. So in some ways, like your space actually becomes an artificial constraint on your ability to grow. I think in a place like San Francisco where we have such a transient attitude towards life, you know, what is my next job? What is my next apartment? What is my next whatever? We oftentimes forget that God is saying place matters and he's repeating that over and over and again uh, throughout the scripture. You know, tithes and offerings are like the ultimate short-term investment. It's like, how are we going to pay the bills today? How are we going to pay the bills tomorrow? How are we going to carry out the programs that we've set forward for us as a church? And really, home is more like a venture capital investment. You know, it's, it's a long-term investment in the future of a thing that we believe is going to be bigger and different and challenging in different ways in the future. Um, and it's something, a legacy that can be left behind for our children and our grandchildren and the thousands of people that are as yet unreached by Epic that will be part of our community moving forward. Will we bring our best for those who aren't here yet? You guys, if we're going to maximize the season that we're in and maximize the opportunity that's before us with this home initiative, we need to embrace something that the Father had in this parable. And here it is, imagination. Like, Ben, how do you know his imagination? Like, I don't see anything about his imagination. Well, did he hesitate when his son showed up to know what to do? Did he hesitate in knowing what to say? Did he hesitate in knowing what to give? He had been, I don't know, maybe in a rocking chair and just thinking, if he comes home, if he comes home, if he comes home. Guys, we have to light up our imagination. Some of you have crazy imaginations. I get emails from you, I know. It's like, and, and then I remember, what am I supposed to say? Hey, that's not a dumb question. Yeah, so I'm like, that's not a dumb question. Um, come on, get around. But our imagination needs to be heightened. Here's what I want to say to you. Imagine making a way for those who will come home. Without imagination, this church never starts. Without imagination, kids' ministry never gets off the ground. We don't care without, like, without, without imagining what could be possible. And so we enter into it. But imagine making a way for those who will come home. Like the woman who showed up two years ago. I'll never forget my first um, one-on-one meeting with her. She, she had a broken heart. Like her heart was literally breaking because her husband had just left her for another woman. And yet simultaneously, while her heart was still breaking, her heart was also opening. And I've seen over the last two years God do something enormous in her life, not because it's been easy. It's been hard as hell for her. And yet she's leaning in and peace is coming into her life. And she's beginning to serve other people, which is amazing, right, when you're in that sort of situation. And here's what you have to know. This is what we're after. Her husband may not want her, but her God does. Her husband may have nothing to do with her future, but God has so much she's coming to the reality to do in her future. And we've got to continue to pave the way for people like that. Would you agree? Because we're all people like that different gender maybe, maybe a different story. We've got to continue to pay the way forward. There's a young man in our community who was in this neighborhood of Soma back in April, and that day he tried to end his life. I don't understand fully how he was rescued from that. It could have only been God, though. But you tell me, what are the chances that six months later he would be attending an Alpha retreat in our church, and that retreat would just so happen to take place on the same block where he tried to kill himself? And since then, he's placed his faith in Jesus here. Pastor Will baptized him right over in that corner. And if you would see him, and perhaps he's in the room today, he's smiling so much that you're like, what's wrong with this guy? Nothing. Everything's right with this guy. Yeah. And, and here's what you got to know. Do whatever you need to do. Make this home initiative about whatever you need to make it about. But this home initiative is about what it's always been about from day one here at Epic. Moving my family out, out here, same thing. Hiring the best team we can find, same thing. The reason we work hard, same thing. The reason why 40 plus people open their homes for you to have a small group, same thing. The reason why your kids are being served, same thing. The reason why students at 12 o'clock have a place to come. Guys, we've always been about helping people come home. And I will give my life, and I will urge you to give yours to making that possible, whatever the means is to that ultimate end. I will not apologize for it. I will not back down for it. I will say, I need somebody to go with me. Who's in? Who's in? I thought it was rhetorical. <laughs> Maybe I am doing it all by myself. <laughs> a week from today is commitment day for this home initiative. Next week I'll give a talk I'm calling The Privilege of Participation. 
And after I teach and I pray for us, we will collectively bring our gifts and commitments down to the stage and just lay it down as a symbolic gesture of an offering before God. And we'll be asking him in that moment to multiply our resources and to do and provide and unlock that next space for us so that people can come home. What will you do with it if you're part of this church, if you're watching online right now? What are you going to do? I hope that we will lean in for the sake of who will show up here one day. But understand this, this whole idea of doing something in one season for the future blessing for others, it's kind of at the heart of our whole Christian faith. Would you agree? This is kind of how it's always gone. God creates. Why? For the future. He calls Abraham to leave so that he will be a blessing to all nations for the future. Jesus, you'll see this on the screen, Jesus left what was comfortable for him so that he might bring home to humanity. Do you remember Jesus shows up and he's bringing home to humanity? And then when he is about to leave the disciples, they're scared to death as they should be. He says to them, if I go away, I'm going to prepare a home for you. Everything in all of creation and where we're going to end our eternity, which by the way won't end, is in the presence of God. But here's what I know. Not only are we going to invest as a church, some of you right now, you're in that distant land and you need to hear me prophetically say to you today, it's time to come home. It's time to come home. No condemnation. The scripture says that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. It's time to come home. And you, sir, lady, You need to let someone know that before you leave today. This is why we do what we're doing. It's why we've always done. It's why we will continue to do so that people just like you in a moment where you're like, could this be even true for me? You can hear today it's true for you. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to respond with a song that Zach's written that we love around here, but it's all about what we're talking about today called Home. And communion is going to be available for those of us who've already placed our faith in Jesus or maybe just did. Some of you, this will be the first time you've taken communion since you came away from that distant land back home to God. Enjoy that so much. Taking the bread, representing Jesus' Jesus' body, dipping into the cup, representing the blood that was spilled so that you could be forgiven. And as we take and eat of those elements today, here's what I want us to think. Jesus, thank you. Through your cross and resurrection, you made a way for me to have home with you both now and forevermore. It's time to come home. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this story. I pray that we would never get familiar with this story so that it no longer impacts us. I pray that we would see ourselves in the story and we would move towards the Father's heart, either in one of two ways, God. The first way being that we just need to come home. God, the second way being that we need to adopt the Father's posture and heart as our own today. God, thank you Then, when I was a teenager living far from home, wanting nothing to do with you. I had parents who were praying me in back to that return. God, would you bring the return of so many today? God, for some, it won't be a return. It'll be a first time to come home. God, I pray for every man and woman who's struggling right now with two things. Number one, will they believe it for themselves from you? And number two, can they have the courage to come to their senses and to walk back home today? Would they find your loving arms ready to embrace as they do? In Jesus' name, amen. In this moment, communion here and here and then towards the back on this side. What do you need to do today with what you've heard? Maybe it's coming home to Jesus. Maybe it is returning from the land you've been living in. Maybe it's coming home for the first time. Maybe it is being honest about the reality that you've been so self-absorbed that you have a home here and you're You've been good with that, but today God's wanting to expand your heart to give you a heart for others. Let's sing as we respond. Come home.